Hey everybody, welcome to today's State of Politics live stream on Gunjin World. And if you're watching on YouTube, welcome as well. Uh, today we've got some breaking news. Of course, the former Chinese Communist official leader, Jiang Zemin, has died. Uh, his nickname for a very long time uh, was called the Toad, and uh, he has passed away. Now, of course, this is being reported as uh, one of, you know, there, there's different ways for people that they've been trying to remember him, right? Today, our title is called Why We Shouldn't mourn the death of Jiang Zemin, despite, you know, the Chinese saying goes, when somebody dies, uh, they're supposed to be mourned and they're supposed to be respected. So I'll tell you that in a bit, but let's kind of first talk about uh, who was he, why does he matter to us here in the West, uh, what exactly has he done for China, and how we got here now, given the recent protests, etc. So there's a lot to talk about, and let's get started. First of all, thank you again for watching, and make sure to subscribe to the channel if you're new, uh, but also comment below what you think about our videos, and uh, as well as turn on your notification bell so you never miss our new content. Now, let's first go through some of the key pictures, let's just call it. Uh, the reason why he's called the Toad is because he's, he kind of looks like a toad, basically. Um, back in 1998, in Beijing, there were people floating this kind of like folklore uh, saying that when the toad speaks, he floods the country. Because uh, I think in 1998, there was floods everywhere in China. And, and so people in Beijing started calling him the toad, right? And then it got picked up over the years just because of the way he looked, uh, the way he dressed. I think I was looking at some pictures before this and he had uh, some really weird ways of dressing. So let's see if I can... I can find it here and I'll pull it up. Uh, but, but basically, you know, the, the way that he looks, like this picture here, so I'll share with you right now. Let's see if you can see it. So just some of these, the way he looked, right? Uh, people call him the Tolt. But who was he? Well, John Zemin was um, the, the CCP official uh, two term, or I guess two leaders before Xi Jinping. So it would have been from 1989, uh, right after Tiananmen Square massacre, until about 2004. But really, his, his uh, political presence remained to this day, until his death, okay? as tends to be all the communist leaders uh, and their influence. So Chinese leader Jiang Zemin, the former official, uh, allegedly paved the way for the country's emergence as a global superpower has died. State-run Tsinghua News Agency announced Wednesday morning he was 96. The former chief of the ruling Communist Party and state president died of leukemia and associated multiple organ failure on Wednesday in Shanghai. He is survived by his wife, two sons, and two grandchildren. So Jiang Zemin was, um, how he basically got started and why it matters to us is uh, in two big areas. One is setting up the political stage of what we're seeing in China today, which is this lockdown, the, the surveillance, the uh, theft of intellectual property, exploitation of our economy and, and the supply chain, all of these things started with Jiang Zemin. So he had direct impact on exploiting American businesses and American economy, which I will go into details in just a bit. But also the second one is he set up a complete control apparatus for the Chinese people uh, starting in the late 90s, and it still runs and evolves, uh, you know, continues on till this day. So first of all, you might remember he was the one that um, under his administration, China became a member of the World Trade Organization in 2001. Uh, and then, of course, with the help from the United States under uh, Bill Clinton, he offered an opportunity for China to be accepted, so to speak, into the global market and to become one like the West, right? This was the thinking back in the day that if China got enough money, they would somehow abandon the communist uh, ruling and uh, basically embrace capitalism as the more superior way of functioning, uh, except it didn't happen. But China instead, from 2001, after the accession into the World Trade Organization to when the United States um, was attacked during 9-11, until now, China has enjoyed a, a, a roughly about 15 years of what they would call a boom period of Chinese economy, all the while the United States and the rest of the world was focused on the war on terror. Uh, and then when 2008 rolled around, that was when China saw another golden opportunity for development. So all of these started in the late 1990s to 2001, uh, when China was a part of the WTO. That's when things started to 
get really, really bad for the United States, uh, in particular in relations to China. It was also around the same time, you'll notice that uh, China's relationship with Wall Street uh, essentially boomed as well because when money flows from the US to China, China then uses those in, uh, the, the amount of money that they get as engagement benefits for Wall Street to further invest into China because, I mean, who doesn't want to see a booming economy? Who doesn't want to make money, right? So around the same time, China started to gain massive amounts of influence in Wall Street as well. And then throughout his time uh, in the late 1990s, so how Zhang got started first was actually he was the, one of the biggest beneficiaries of the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989, June 4th, right? Before that, Zhang was about to retire in Shanghai as the party secretary, and uh, he was um, he was about to get a promotion to go to Beijing and become one of the top central officials. Uh, and uh, back then, the, the the top paramount leader was still Deng Xiaoping. You know, the, the short guy that that was basically responsible for. Uh, opening fire on the students in Tiananmen Square. Zhang Zemin was one that kind of facilitated and he, he made use of personal relationships, uh, tactics that were very disgusting uh, to essentially win over Deng's trust as his kind of ruthless successor, right? And what had happened was Deng, before Deng, uh, had, named Deng uh, had named Zhang Zemin as the, um, as the head of state for the next period. Deng actually had to abolish two of his named successors, uh, Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang, who one suffered a heart attack, and which subsequently led to the protest on June 4th, and the other one, of course, was supporting his colleague, and then he was also um, soft, jailed-ish, uh, and, and was, was uh, stripped from his power, basically. So then Zhang Zemin came into power, and immediately he started to crack down on the aftermath of um, 1989, which was he would jail dissidents, silence them. Uh, he would start what is known as kind of the post Deng period, early Zhang period, where he would kind of walk in the path of Deng Xiaoping to do the so-called opening up and reform. But then deep down, he had his own agenda. So a little bit more historical background, because it's very important to know before we talk about more of the business and the political side of things. Uh, Zhang Zemin was the his, his dad was, um, he, he came from a really big family during the Japanese occupation period, and his dad was a, a, a trader, basically. He was working for the Japanese puppet government, the puppet regime in China, and then see, he also encouraged his son, so Zhang Zemin, to get involved in there as well. And then after the Japanese occupation, so World War II, uh, Zhang Zemin actually went to go study in Russia, and then it was during that time he met a uh, KGB agent, this this girl, and then they had an affair. Uh, these things were, intel uh, through the KGB's intelligence gathering, it, it was found that he was, you know, doing these type of things. Um, when he later became the general secretary, so the paramount leader, he was actually this became part of the the scandalous aspect of it. So when Boris Yeltsin came to uh, visit in 1994. Let's see here. This is a report by the Was uh, Los Angeles Times. In 1994, China and Russia signed a pact that actually, uh, most people in China would call it giving or selling out land to Russia. Basically, um, Jiang Zemin signed an agreement here with Boris Yeltsin and gave away about 2,725 mile uh, along the border and a huge pieces of land to Russia, uh, essentially. And, and this part of the land was, in their view, a, a so-called historical achievement, but really was, was just Jiang Zemin selling out the, the land to China in fear that his scandals would be exposed. And throughout his time, one of the biggest things around him was his, his lustful, uh, how do you say, conducts, right? He, there, were, there were a lot of prop, like scandals with him and a famous singer. Uh, you had pictures like the one you saw in the thumbnail uh, of him just, he, he's a very lustful guy, right? And then he, the way that he actually climbed up the political ladder in China was also because he bribed his way through the uh, military. So when you become the Communist Party ruler, 
you have to have some sort of a credibility within the, uh, the, the, the political, but also the military side of things, right? He didn't have any credibility. So the way that he d uh, ascended power was by bribing officials. And now when he did uh, become the paramount leader after Deng Xiaoping, he continued this type of party corruption. And in fact, he was the one that kind of expanded this corruption aspect in China, uh, inside the Communist Party. And in doing so, officials from top to bottom, like we're talking state level, uh, provincial government level, city level, we're talking even in villages, nobody in China that was a, an official of the Communist Party uh, were not doing things like grafts, they weren't trying to get money and they weren't trying to do things like um, prostitution, girls, etc. Like all of these bad things, right? And it actually was normalizing this type of behaviors in the, the Chinese Communist Party. And so the joke is that like if you lined up 10 people in a row and you, you, you shot all of them, right? Uh, nine out of 10 chances you get people who have corruption uh, history. But then if you chose every second person, uh, you would at least missed 99% of the people who are corrupt. So basically it shows you that the amount of corruption that goes on in, inside the Chinese Communist Party. And that continued, right? Uh, after the World Trade Organization uh, deal was finalized and China became a part of WTO, what happened was Zhang's faction, the Shanghai clique or, or whatever it's called, they started to kind of like um, personalize or fam familyize, I don't know what the word for that is, uh, basically, they incorporated a bunch of big corporations in China, but they were all controlled and managed by offsprings and families and relatives of the Zhang faction, meaning that they essentially uh, privatized in a way into their family, all of China's state-run uh, enterprises. And uh, some of that money, a lot of it actually, billions of dollars, ended up back so the money that were invested into China, they ended up back going out to other countries because all of these corrupt officials had sent their, uh, the, either their wives and kids or other family members or whoever out to the United States and Canada and other countries with the huge amount of money that they had gotten from corruption. Um, and then just all of that amount of money, instead of giving it to the Chinese people, they were being sent out to other countries. And so the point is like, when you talk about Jiang Zemin, we can't really say that he was somehow a really good Chinese leader because he facilitated the growth of, of China in a economic boom, when in reality, the, the economic boom comes from the United States helping China become a part of the WTO. And in doing so, there's also something else I think is worthy of sharing. Um, let me just try to find it here. Jiang Zemin was also responsible for the China Great Firewall. This is something, a project that his son started in 1998 called the Golden Shield Project. And during this project development, they found out that they really needed a, um, a system that can surveil people, censor people, and then at the same time provide stability for the regime. So in 1999, Jiang Zemin actually started a uh, nationwide persecution against a group called Falun Gong. And these were people that were just like old grandmas and grandpas and uh, working class people doing exercises in the park, right? Uh, at the time, there was about 100 million people in China practicing Falun Gong. That number alone was already more than the actual numbers of the Communist Party officials uh, and, and its membership. It was much bigger than that in China. So to Jiang Zemin, somebody who lacked credibility from his ascension to power, he could not stand something else being more legitimate and more influential than him. So he, against the pushbacks from even within the Politburo Standing Committee, which is China's ruling circle, he started this persecution. Uh, part of the reason is he was able to control the, the, the amount of information coming out of China through the, China, the Great Firewall system and even in its early inceptions was able to control information to essentially make China, instead of an internet space, an, an intranet, uh, something ca caged in and something that you cannot get information in or out of China, right? And then that evolved to today, what we're seeing now in China, this huge censorship, all of that actually originated under Jiang Zemin as well. Then also on the other side, you have something called a 610 system. This 610 system is a, it's not really a, a real lawful entity in China. It was created as an extra legal system outside of the justice legal system to, for, the, for the exact purpose to persecute Falun Gong practitioners, arrest them, kidnap them, uh, with the ability to move state resources 
at its disposal in any unlimited amount possible. Essentially, what we're seeing now is the 610 office, which was directly led and responsible by the John faction, uh, would later evolve into what we're seeing now is the COVID task force system in China. Every province, every city, every municipality has a task force for COVID. These task forces don't have any lawful or judicial standings to them, except they're just these extra legal creations that the Communist Party from the top down created, um, essentially taking a lot of the elements of the 610 office, right? The 610 office was very much responsible for persecuting religious minorities, but then at the same time, they created a model for China kind of like the Gestapo's, like to do whatever they want outside of the law. Both the COVID task force and the 610 system had unlimited resources at their disposal and they can command people like in the health sector, political sector, the business sector, etc. All of these things are uh, under the command of the task force, right? Another thing that John was also doing was he was overseeing what we now know is a crime against humanity, right? It is the let me try to find it. Um, forced organ harvesting in China. So remember this, we found out now that uh, there is a, a, a huge amount of evidence suggesting that prisoners of conscience and say the Uyghur population are primary targets. Falun Gong is actually the first to, uh, let me just zoom, zoom out a little bit on this. There we go. To become a target of so the method of forced organ harvesting was one that the method of execution becomes that uh, organ harvesting itself, right? So they would, uh, you know, arrest a bunch of these uh, practitioners of Falun Gong, bring them to jail, and then they would start doing these um, health exams on them, regular health exams. Tissue, uh, blood, they would test their organs, and they, they, they would do these tests without telling them why they were doing these tests, right? And then according to Ethan Gutman and also uh, David Matus and David Kelgore, who are two human rights lawyers from Canada, these tests were done so natural in a way that people don't really understand why they were being tested. But then we started hearing stories about people disappearing in, in, uh, in China and then a sudden rise of organ transplants done like the actual procedures done in China. And there were some stories that I, I, I don't have the time for the details on it, but basically you could get something like a heart within a week of going to China, which is something unimaginable in the West, right? In the United States, you can, it could take up to three years for you to get a heart. And we know that having a transplant surgery requires you to have a tissue type match and also a blood type match. And to get those two meaning that means that you have to wait a long time to have a suitable donor who is willing to give their organ to you, uh, which is something in China apparently you can just do in three days or in a week, right? So the speculations and, and now a lot of evidence suggest that there's a mounting, uh, I guess, a mounting amount of evidence suggesting that China is having a, or they do already have an organ supply pool, which means that there's a huge amount of data that they can pull from telling us who exactly has what type of organs, who is ready to be donating them, and who is going to receive them. And all of these are done through a huge network sanctioned by the Chinese state uh, of Chinese hospitals working with prison camps, labor camps, and then working with the Chinese police force and the 610 system, harvesting organs from Falun Gong practitioners, which were being arrested in numbers of hundreds of thousands, and also now the Uyghur population. Well, that's another topic to go into more details, but the gist of it is these were also sanctioned under the, the Jiang Zemin regime. Remember, he had started the persecution of Falun Gong back in 1999. He made sure that China, in China, it was legal uh, in the way that you can to persecute Falun Gong practitioners. And then that kicked off a state system now is being deployed against Tibetans, uh, the Uyghur population, house Christians in China, and that's just in the domestic arena, right? If you consider what we went through with China in the recent years, we saw the rise of the military. We saw the rise of their financial power, enough to rival the United States. We saw how impactful the Wall Street lobbies were and the K Street firm lobbies were for China. Where did they get all this money from? Well, I talked about it already. They were getting investments into China from the early 80s, but it ramped up under Jiang Zemin. Jiang Zemin allowed China to get so much foreign investments 
to help its economy become a powerhouse within 15 years. And by the time the United States realized that they were actually now having to compete with China rather than help China, it was already too late. The Wall Street people were thinking, as long as we make money, we don't care if China has human rights violations. We don't care if uh, you know, China is stealing our intellectual property. We don't care if their military is strong enough. All they looked at was the economic aspect. That's why today I was kind of surprised on Twitter, actually. A lot of people were saying, oh, you know, Jiang's legacy was improving China's GDP. Yeah, well, he did improve China's GDP, but GDP is a hollow number without actual benefits to the people, right? China was getting rich. 50% of the people at least were getting rich. But then that comes with the, was the, what came with that was the exploitation of the other 50%. To this day, we still have a huge discrepancy of wealth in China where you have the rich of the richest uh, and then the poorer of the poorest, right? So all of these tie together really one thing that I think is very interesting is that Jiang Zemin is somebody who is based on recency bias being compared to Xi Jinping as some sort of a saint. But if you really think about it, how Xi Jinping even got to sit in the throne today was because of Jiang Zemin. And that's really the political part as well. Uh, back in uh, Deng Xiaoping's era, so the guy before Jiang Zemin, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, I think in the early or late 90s, or maybe even 1989, I can't really remember, but uh, Jiang, uh, Deng Xiaoping had made a rule inside the party saying that the person in power could not name his successor, but he could name the person after the successor of whoever comes after him. So basically, if, if Deng Xiaoping named somebody, which at the time was Hu Jintao, you know, the guy that was taken for, on camera, taken away from the closing ceremony a month ago. So Deng Xiaoping had named Hu Jintao as Deng's successor. Zhang Zemin was kind of like the pl uh, placeholder person for Hu Jintao to come into power. Except Jiang Zemin knows that what he really craves for is also power. He, in fact, held on to real influence and even like the military position for two more years after he quote unquote retired. And uh, he, throughout Hu Jintao's entire time, Jiang Zemin was really still very influential in China um, in terms of the, the Communist Party. But basically when, when Hu Jintao uh, was named successor, Jiang Zemin wanted to name somebody that he could succeed Hu Jintao with, right, skipping a generation. And so he influenced uh, the decision making to put Xi Jinping as the final result of party inner party power struggle. And essentially that's the result we're seeing now. If it weren't for Jiang Zemin, Xi Jinping wouldn't even be in power. Of course now Jiang Zemin and Xi Jinping, they're kind of rival factions. But back in the days, Jiang Zemin actually helped Xi Jinping become uh, the, the, the paramount leader today. And I think there's a lot to be said about um, about people like Jiang Zemin. The reason is, if you look at his lust for power, it was, there, obviously all the dictators are obsessed with powers, right? But the most important manifestation of Jiang's lust for power was when he retired in 2003. So when Hu Jintao came on, he held for the military, central military chairman position for two more years. When you have the military in the party, you have the most amount of power, right? And the only way for him to maintain legitimacy like Jiang Zemin was through corruption. And so throughout Jiang Zemin's years, the military was the most corrupt in its like, form ever. And uh, it wasn't until the, the anti-corruption later on in the 2010s that things kind of changed a little bit. But when we consider the fact that the Jiang Zemin had a say in who he wanted to put into power after Hu Jintao, it really tells us that uh, the rule of terror is, uh, it, it breeds terror, right? If you have Jiang Zemin, somebody who's concentrating power uh, for himself for 10 years, but of course he had no grounds and no credibility to continue to stay in power, so he had to kind of retire. Uh, the, it makes sense for us, for us to see why now Xi Jinping is somebody who is holding on to power so dearly and, and never wants to let it go. Because within the Communist Party, the, the internal faction fighting the way that Jiang Zemin rose to power, the way Xi Jinping rose to power, and the way every other leader rose to power is through brutal internal party fights, right? And so the loser will lose everything, the winner takes all. And in this case, we can really imagine and kind of see the reason why Jiang Zemin's death is one that has no benefits to the people at all. And in fact, today I was hearing people talk about like, oh, you know, this Western media saying that 
the death of Jiang Zemin is going to spark another wave of protest because people are walking out like they did in 1989 because a former leader Hu Yaoban died. The difference between that was Jiang Zemin was the one directly responsible for cracking down on students in Tiananmen Square listening to the orders of Deng Xiaoping. He was not somebody who people who are pro-protest or pro-democracy in China should mourn for. Right? Without Jiang Zemin, we wouldn't have the aftermath of 1989 today. And so he's not somebody that we should really mourn for. If you're an American, you shouldn't really think this way either. Because Jiang Zemin was directly setting up the... Uh, I guess you'd call it, he was planting the seeds for what we now have to deal with, which is a China that's super powerful, financially, military, everything, re really ready to compete and take over from the United States, threatening our safety, national security. They're th uh, stealing our power and they're also taking, you know, the entire generation of kids with them through TikTok, through WeChat, through uh, Chinese softwares and games and all of these things. So what China has been doing for the past 20 years is both harmful to themselves and to us, right? And all of that started with Jiang Zemin. Another point I think to conclude with all of this is if you take a look at the future of China, of course, this all happened during the massive protest that China has been witnessing, something unprecedented since 1989. So you, you might be wondering if this is all kind of like a distraction from the real problem China's having. Uh, of course, that's true, right? I, I don't have any doubt about this, but this is also something to remember that uh, mourning somebody like Jiang Zemin, who is committing crimes against humanity, not just to the religious people in China, of course, but also now to the entirety of the population of China, right? People thought that when they surrender their personal liberty and political liberty for the sake of making money in China in the 90s and early 2000s, that uh, things would get better, except it didn't, right? That thinking is what directly led to the encroachment of the state security apparatus, the digital surveillance, authoritarianism, and also to China, the Communist Party of China, the CCP, ultimately having complete control of the people. It is through these giving up of getting money and nothing in return. And not to talk about the morality decline in China after Jiang Zemin became uh, general secretary because like I said he was corrupting everybody he was making that corruption was normal in China he was uh, doing all these things with uh, different girls actresses and all of these and so it was really setting up a period of destruction that's why in China today you see all of these tragedy right locking people down for two months no food people suiciding because they were locked inside uh, you have families separated you had pregnant women who have to give birth in front of the hospital because they can't be admitted into the hospital because they didn't have a COVID test. All of these things really trace back to Jiang Zemin as somebody in modern day who was beginning to use things like technology, to use things like financial and state power, and also to use things like propaganda to really enhance brainwashing of the Chinese people. And to now what we're seeing is the fruition of all of his doing. And so I think from a rational perspective, we should see him as somebody who's to blame for what we're dealing with today, even 20 years after he gave up power. Uh, so I think that, that's where I'll leave off for today's episode. And, and I think it's really good to remember that at any given time, today we're, we know that Hitler is somebody we don't really mourn for, we, we don't cherish his uh, accomplishments, just like how we shouldn't do that with communist leaders either, right? The, they, the CCP killed a million, 100 million people, um, and I think that's worthy of whatever accomplishment, right? These accomplishments are also false as well. So, But anyways, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening to me and watching, but uh, if you enjoy the content, make sure to subscribe and comment below what you'd like to see next. Also, like our video and turn on your notification bell so you never miss our content. Anyways, thanks for watching, and uh, I'm David Zhang. See you next time.